So I'm here with Dr. Harvey Oi of the Philippines. And uh, Harvey is one of our medical advisory board members of Cake Magazine. But today we're talking about issues related to pie and standing up to posterior segment complications. Uh, Harvey does a little work across the segments and we're uh, so happy to have him here today. Thanks for joining us, Harvey. Thanks, Matt. It's always a pleasure to be here. All right. So, uh, Harvey, you were telling me a moment ago that you're a fan of uh, the Blues Brothers. Uh, tell me a little bit about why you like that movie. Well, uh, the characters are cool. Yeah. Uh, they make you laugh. And I think laughter is very important for our own uh, well-being. Uh, laughter is truly, uh, um, I guess, the best medicine. Yeah. Uh, and watching the Blues Brothers, uh, it teaches us uh, not to take ourselves too seriously. Yeah. And, and, you know, a moment ago off camera, we were talking about this issue of humility in ophthalmology because, um, you know, so many of us have aspirations to either move up the corporate ladder or uh, to become known as a, you know, a KOL in the industry. But, uh, you know, as you said, it's important to, to, to have a laugh, even at oneself sometimes, to remain human in life. So could you speak to that a little bit and, and, and sort of the value of uh, trying to retain one's uh, humility and humanity in ophthalmology? Well, I think a, a lot of these uh, uh, social studies uh, have shown that if we want to uh, live long, if we want to be happy, uh, it is important to have some amount of uh, financial uh, stability and success. But you know, above a certain level, it doesn't matter how many uh, toys you have, it doesn't matter how many zeros you have in your bank account. In the end, what makes uh, uh, people truly happy is the way that they interact with other people. And very important if we're able to spend a little of our time uh, helping uh, patients uh, do better. Uh, ultimately, that's good for your soul and ultimately that's going to add years to your life. Now, Harvey, we were, we were also talking about, you know, this industry, you stay in it long enough, you have enough aspirations, you're going to start climbing, right? But as you're climbing and you're starting to get into corporate boards or uh, become known as those KOLs on podium, um, some, something happens. You, you start to lose touch with certain aspects, uh, perhaps even lose touch with your patients. So can you tell us a little bit about um, how you keep yourself in line, you know, as, as you've become the great Harvey Oi in our industry. <laughs> Not the great. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so of course we do uh, aspire to move up the value chain and even for myself, I try to uh, move up from uh, seeing just patients to uh, having a group practice to having uh, multiple eye centers, okay. And that's very uh, satisfying uh, to me, but uh, it's also very good for your soul to spend a lot of time with patients, yeah. uh, interact with patients, and identify with patients. So uh, that actually makes you uh, feel that you're contributing to society. Mm. And as we were saying again a moment ago, that um, you know, it's for example in India where you've had this cataract backlog, right? It hasn't been because uh, you haven't eradicated the cataract backlog because. Um, you know, you attended another board meeting. It's getting down there with patients, doing the surgery day in, day out, and very quickly, that actually changed that entire society for the better in terms of their vision. Is that not correct? Yes, I've, I've visited uh, uh, many uh, eye centers, not just in India, but many places in Asia where uh, you see doctors uh, practically from sunup and beyond sunset spending their time uh, doing surgeries and seeing patients, sometimes for very little uh, income. But what's surprising is uh, these doctors are very upbeat. Uh, they're very happy uh, in their work. And that just goes to show you that when you spend some time uh, helping others, uh, you actually will be happier. And that's good for your soul. You relayed the example of Allergan. Um, can you tell me more about that, that, that story? Uh, yes. So. Uh, I was very uh, fortunate and honored uh, to have a meeting with the uh, previous uh, CEO of uh, Allergan, uh, uh, Dr. David Payot. Uh, and 
Allergan is a big S&P 500 company. And I was very uh, impressed by the humility of uh, uh, David Payot because he told me that you know, uh, in Allergan, uh, the income they made, 40% would go into research, which is necessary, and 40% would go into marketing, uh, and 20% of the uh, income would go to salaries of useful, useless, useless persons like himself. Mm. So that, that was an act of humility at the highest levels of the industry. You know, Harvey, um, humor doesn't always seem to have a place in uh, the medical industry, at least not until now. Okay. <laughs> you guys are keeping it there. <laughs> uh, right on, yeah. I just wanted to read you a little uh, excerpt from our letter to readers just to explain uh, what's going on here. And let me know if you agree with this or not. So basically, in our letter to readers in this issue, I said, but there are other forces constantly combating humor in our industry, and most people don't think twice about that. Pride, which sometimes makes its way into the upper echelons of our industry, is one such force. How often have we seen pride, often irrationally believing that one is better than others, end up the butt of many jokes? So therefore, pride and humor aren't easy bedfellows. Would you agree with that, that uh, it's hard to, to have a sense of humor if one is so prideful? Uh, absolutely, and uh, pride, pride is a good thing. It's pride that you know, motivates us to achieve, to do better, and discover things to help more uh, people. But I think for our own uh, health and well-being, uh, it's very good to have some measure of uh, humor. Mm. And um, I think the happiest people are those who, are, who have a lot of laughter. And you can see surveys of uh, people from different countries. And it's not always the people in the countries with the most wealth. Uh, having the highest scores in these happiness surveys. Sometimes people from uh, not, you know, poor countries, yeah. uh, they have very high happiness ratings because while they may not have much financially, they have good social networks, they interact with their uh, friends, families, and that, that keeps them uh, grounded and uh, basically smiling the whole time. And eventually, you, you retain a sense of happiness, you retain your humanity. That's got to be good for patients, right? Yeah, I, I believe if, you're, if your doctors are happy, your staff is going to be happy, and your patients are going to be happy. And if the patients are happy, I think you're more than halfway uh, uh, on the road getting back your good health. Harvey, one other issue that we've explored is uh, this topic of the Philippines and anti-VEGFs. Now, at a conference like this, we hear a lot of talks about, you know, the latest anti-VEGFs that have come out to treat AMD. However, in, a, in the Philippines, as I understand it, uh, because there's no reimbursement for anti-VEGFs, that you're still essentially, uh, you have a lot of laser happening in the Philippines for uh, AMD. And while that helps to treat patients to some extent, it's just not even really standard of care. Um, at this point, and that, that was just a, a shocking thing to me because, um, you know, it, it can be cultural factors, it can be uh, bureaucracies that interfere with the latest treatments. What, what is a patient to do in the Philippines in, in that regard? Not just in the Philippines, but in uh, many uh, developing uh, nations. Yeah. Um, there is a uh, lack of access to health care and coming to a uh, very uh, prestigious, uh, well-organized, and highly scientific meeting like the APVRS meeting. It's nice to see uh, all of the innovations and all of the new drugs that can uh, help our patients uh, get better outcomes. But we have to go back also to uh, patient accessibility and uh, cost effectiveness. So I think a lot of uh, uh, attention should also be uh, paid to this, paid attention to this. So if you have a drug that does wonders but no one can afford it, uh, you know, what, what value does it have? So I think it's also good uh, to generate data that we can take home to our uh, governments, uh, uh, healthcare funders and show them that, you know, in many cases uh, they should actually uh, be giving funding to uh, 
uh, these anti-VEGF treatments. And as for the doctors, uh, we should evaluate the evidence uh, uh, for uh, uh, giving these uh, anti-VEGF and other treatments. But we also, for each patient, have to help the patients uh, uh, understand their disease and make recommendations which uh, are, are also cost-effective, uh, accessible, and ultimately beneficial to them. So in your clinic, Harvey, do you see a lot of patients that come in, um, they can't pay, you know, afford to pay out of pocket for anti-VEGF and instead opt for laser treatment? Uh, yes, we do have uh, patients who uh, would opt for uh, laser treatment over anti-VEGF treatment. And, uh, because it's reimbursed? Because it's uh, fully reimbursed. Yeah. Um, but sometimes we also have to uh, take a little time and maybe sacrifice a little bit to trying to get these patients at least some anti-VEGF treatment or in some cases uh, steroid treatments to uh, decrease the edema of their retina, get them to see better uh, before uh, uh, starting out, uh, before converting them to or shifting them to a laser treatment. So sometimes this combination treatment works, you get the boost from uh, intravitreal medications, yeah. and then you do some laser treatments so that they, the patients are not dependent on uh, uh, these injections to maintain their vision. Mm. Well, certainly laser does have a place uh, in ophthalmology, in, in AMD, uh, perhaps in areas of, of DME and, and for other select cases. Um, and I guess, you know, certainly some treatment is better than none. Yes, yes. You were saying that even, even having a spot, a blind spot in your eye uh, is better than and losing entire vision, no? Yes. So if you make a patient uh, get anti-VEGF injections to maintain their good vision when there's a potentially uh, treatable uh, lesion using laser treatment, uh, and at some point these patients will experience what we call injection fatigue. Yeah. And they'll start stop coming back to your clinic for these uh, monthly shots hmm. and then they may come back years later with worse vision but uh, if you think that they may benefit from laser treatment for example diabetic macular edema once they get a significant amount of vision back you can do some focal laser treatment it may take more effort but ultimately uh, the patients may stabilize and not need to have so many injections same thing applies for uh, some patients with wet AMD uh, and some patients with uh, retinal vein occlusion. Sometimes laser in selective cases will ultimately uh, give the patients the best outcomes. Right. Well, uh, Harvey, we better go off the stage before somebody throws uh, broken beer bottles at okay. us like, uh, <laughs> like in the Blues Brothers. So, anyway, it's great to see you here, pal. All right. All right. All Always. the best. And uh, we'll see you out there somewhere in the world. All right. Always a pleasure, Matt. Good luck. Yeah, thanks.